service with prayer and about everything that came through early this morning at open assembly is on our prayer sheet but would be anything else that we need to remember this morning every heart and mind clear yes Brother Tony, lead us in a word of prayer, if you would. Lord Jesus, we thank you for another day that you've given us, Lord, to live on this earth. <clears throat> we thank you for another day to gather in your house, Lord, to worship you. We ask that you be with all that are here today, Lord. Thank yeah. you, Brother Tom, especially. We thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for our travel and vacation or whatever, Lord. Give us travel and safety. Lord, just everything that's said and done here today, Lord, let it be done to uplift you. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So we do welcome each one this morning to our Father's Day uh, service and hope and pray that you have a wonderful day today. At this time, we're going to turn over to Brother Elton. He's going to sing a special for us after which the choir sing. Contentment at 
this time, I'm going to turn over to Sister Judy. We're going to recognize our fathers at this time. And God bless each of our uh, fathers here today. We did Mother's Day. We had a little fun with the women's last names. Uh, today I'm going to start out with a little fun with the men, some of our father's first names. And you've got to guess which father I'm talking about. Okay, the first one is something you have to pay. Who said it? Rose got it. Bill Bell. Good. Okay. Okay. This is a famous tiger. Tony the Tiger, <laughs> okay. Where you play basketball? Gym, we got lots of gyms. Okay, I had to have that one. A boy goat. Billy, <laughs> you'll have to tell him that, Brother Tommy. Okay, now you have to be in my age group or older to get this one. A kind of pen that we used to use to roll our hair. Bobby Penn, <laughs> Bobby Henry, a famous child whose mother is Kate, not William, but George, right, the new baby, okay, we follow his rules of order when conducting business, if you've been in any kind of club, and even in church you're supposed to do this, you follow blank's rule of orders, Robert, good. <laughs> okay, Robert's rule of order. I don't know who Robert was, but no matter what kind of group you're in, you usually have a parliamentarian, you know, that makes sure you're following Robert's rules of orders. Okay, a few little jokes here. Dad, sweetie, if you keep pulling my hair, you have to get off my shoulders, daughter. But, Dad, I'm just trying to get my gum back. <laughs> What do you call a grizzly bear with no teeth? A gummy bear. <laughs> you might not have experienced that, but Linda and I, when we were young, our grandfather would oftentimes take his teeth out <laughs> and just sing, I mean, just eat with his gums, right? Whoever said nothing is impossible never tried to slam a revolving door. Father, let me see your report card. Son, I don't have it. Father, why not? Son, my friend just borrowed it. He wants to scare his parents. <laughs> Dad, you'll never amount to anything because you procrastinate. Son, oh yeah? Just you wait. I like this one. How many ears did Davy Crockett have? Three. A left ear, a right ear, and a wild frontier. <laughs> Daddy, Daddy, can I have another glass of water, please? But I've given you ten glasses of water already. Yes, but the bedroom's still on fire. <laughs> Five-year-old Becky answered the door when the census taker came, and she told the census taker that her daddy was a doctor and wasn't home because he was performing an appendectomy. My, said the census taker, that sure is a big word for such a little girl. Do you know what it means? Sure, 1500 bucks, and that doesn't even include the anesthesiologist. <laughs> <laughs> Thanksgiving Day was approaching, and a family received a Thanksgiving card with a painting of a pilgrim family on the way to church. Grandma showed the card to her small grandchildren, observing. The pilgrim children like to go to church with their mothers and fathers. Oh, yeah, said the grandson. So why is their dad carrying his rifle? <laughs> a little child in church for the first time watched as the ushers passed the offering plates. When they neared the pew where he sat, the youngster spoke up to everyone so they could hear and said, 
Don't pay for me, Daddy. I'm under five. A young boy had just gotten his driving permit, and he asked his father, who, who was a minister, if they could discuss the use of the car. His father took him to his study and said to him, I'll make a deal with you. You bring your grades up, study your Bible, and get your hair cut, and we'll talk about it. After about a month, the boy came back again and asked his father if they could discuss the use of the car. They again went to the father's study, where his father said, Son, I've been real proud of you. You brought your grades up, you've studied your Bible diligently, but you didn't get your hair cut. The young man waited a moment and replied, You know, Dad, I've been thinking about that. You know, Samson had long hair, Moses had long hair, Noah had long hair, and even Jesus had long hair, to which his father replied, Yes, you're right. And they also walked everywhere they went. <laughs> Okay, these are some famous sayings uh, that people have said about fathers. It doesn't matter who my father was, it matters who I remember he was. I don't mind looking into the mirror and seeing my father. My father never talked to me about how to treat people. Every act of kindness I have ever shown another person was because I was trying to imitate him. My prescription for success, and Linda, this is Kenny's favorite coach that said this, my prescription for success is based on something my father always used to tell me. You should never try to be better than someone else, but you should never cease trying to be the best you can be. That was John Wooden. <clears throat> By profession, I am a soldier and take pride in that fact. But I am prouder, infinitely prouder, to be a father. A soldier destroys in order to build. The father only builds and never destroys. The one has the potentiality of death, the other embodies creation and life. And while the hordes of death are mighty, the battalions of life are mightier still. It is my hope that my son, when I am gone, will remember me not from the battlefield, but in the home, repeating with him our simple daily prayer, Our Father, who art in heaven. One night a father overheard his son pray, Dear God, make me the kind of man my daddy is. Later that night the father prayed, Dear God, make me the kind of man my son wants me to be. It is easier for a father to have children than for children to have a real father. He didn't tell me how to live. He lived and let me watch him do it. There are three stages of a man's life. He believes in Santa Claus. He doesn't believe in Santa Claus. He is Santa Claus. Sigmund Freud said this last one, I cannot think of any need in childhood as strong as the need for a father's protection. Uh, and I, I think that's what that song, Faith of Our Fathers, is talking about. Just the way God protects us, he planned for the father of a family to protect the children. Uh, I was looking for a a poem. I always try to find one that's a little bit on the serious side uh, to read before we do the, the gifts. Um, and this one was kind of different, and I, I thought this kind of fits our world today because we have so many different kinds of fathers today, some good, some not so good. And just I thought this kind of addressed all of them, and I liked it. It says, Let us honor those fathers who have striven to balance the demands of work, marriage, and children, with an honest awareness of both joy and sacrifice. Let us honor those fathers who, lacking a good model for a father, have worked to become a good father. Let us honor those fathers who, by their own account, were not always there for their children, but who continue to offer those children, now grown, their love and support. Let us pray for those fathers who have been wounded by the neglect and hostility of their own children. Let us honor those fathers who, despite divorce, have remained in their children's lives. 
Let us honor those fathers whose children are adopted and whose love and support has offered healing. Let us honor those fathers who, as stepfathers, freely choose the obligation of fatherhood and earn their stepchildren's love and respect. Let us honor those fathers who have lost a child to death and continue to hold the child in their heart. Let us honor those men who have no children but cherish the next generation as if they were their own. Let us honor those men who have fathered us in their role as mentors and guides. Let us honor those men who are about to become fathers, may they openly delight in their children. Let us honor those fathers who have died, but live on in our memory and whose love continues to nurture us. And most of all, let us honor and praise our Heavenly Father, who is there to show all our fathers how to point their children in the right direction, so they learn early in life about trust, faith, and love. I thought that was precious. Kind of covered all of our fathers. Now we get to do our fun fathers first, <laughs> our funny fathers, I guess. The young father doesn't mind raising his hand, but the older ones do, I think, sometimes. Okay, we'll start with the youngest. If you're under 40, raise your hand. We only have one under 40? Oh, my goodness. Okay, Jeremy, congratulations. <laughs> children downstairs <laughs> okay our oldest father okay I can get a bunch of hands if you're over 70 raise your hand if you're over 75 keep your hand up Ooh, over 76 over 77 over 78 over 79 over 80 brother Carlos congratulations <laughs> Okay, the one with the most children, if you have more than two, raise your hand. If you have more than three, raise your hand. More than four. More than five. Fill up. <laughs> to honor all our fathers so would all of our fathers please stand all of our fathers and you don't have to be a member of this church I should have said that earlier when we were doing these other things but if you're a visitor and you're a father please stand not missing anybody good let's give them a hand I will say this month over the much over the last few years we've lost several of our fathers um, but I look at this group of men, and I see a wonderful group of role models. And that's what we need in this world today. I'm afraid that's where our world's lacking, and role models, models as fathers. And I, I know um, on all the things that we hear about in the most recent, the shooting in South Carolina, um, you want to say to yourself, you know, what role did that father have in that child's life as they were growing up? And uh, I fully believe the scripture is true that um, if children are exposed to church and to the real meaning of life, that they retain that. They don't lose it. Uh, they may stray away from it for a while, but it's still there in their mind. Uh, and so we need to especially pray today for fathers. And I, I'm going to do that a little bit different. I'm going to ask Brother Tommy right now to say a special prayer just for fathers in our world today. Thank you, sir. I was planning on doing this anyway, so okay. let's everyone stand. I want to have a moment of silence in memory. We've lost a lot of fathers, yes, some good fathers in our church. I mean good fathers in our church. So let's just take a few moments, and, and would you remember the fathers of our church that you know that have gone on to be with the Lord? And I'll close with a little word of prayer in just a few moments.
Father in heaven, in my memory, I was trying to just briefly remember so many who have uh, graced the, the, the doors of this church. So many have been faithful uh, givers, givers of themselves, given of their substance, showed a great love toward this church, and we placed it at rest. Some wonderful, wonderful people of God. We pray that their memories will live long in our hearts and in our minds. And as long as the world stands, as long as this church stands, I pray that they will always be thought of as still their spirit as a part of this church. We love them much and miss them very, very much. And we thank you this morning, dear Lord, for this day that our nation has set aside. We call Father's Day, sort of like Mother's Day. It was so wonderful to recognize our mothers. Today, we recognize our fathers. And I pray that as we conclude our services after a while, we know we'll not have an evening worship hour, but I hope that the children who can will do something special for their fathers. If it's nothing but just a big hug and tell them they love them, that's so important. Today, this world is lacking the great love, truly spiritual love that's so needed in families today. Thank you for Sister Judy who always does such a, a good job of taking care of this little part of our Mother's and Father's Day service. And thank you for the love that you've bestowed upon our church. I believe we'll all have to say this morning together, you've been good to us. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray and amen. You may be seated. Okay. Fathers, remain standing, please. Josh, if you'll come up and help me. <laughs> I know you have plenty of energy. <laughs> Let me just make a couple of announcements, then we'll take our morning time. Do remember, we'll, like Mother's Day, we'll not have an evening worship, but we'll meet back again Sunday, e uh, Sunday Wednesday evening. And I want you to pray for Jeremy and Noah. They, boy, I tell you, y'all had a yard full of young ones the other night. That's great. We just, boy, we know how much we appreciate what you're doing for the Lord. Our, you had many prayers prayed for. We'll continue to do that part for sure. So uh, do remember this. Uh, also, I want to take a moment and thank our church for a homecoming last Sunday. I tell you, I don't know how many, I don't know whether you count, fit. we fed a lot of people uh, last Sunday. It was full, and praise the Lord for that, and for all who were as faithful as possible to the uh, uh, revival service. Uh, and I thought everything went real good. I thought Dr. Riggs done a tremendous job, and uh, he wrote us a little note. He said, Dear Brother Tommy Church, once again, I want to thank you for the opportunity of being with you and your congregation. It's always my pleasure. Uh, you have a very uh, wonderful church and wonderful people. It was a great joy and honor to be there with you. And I uh, want to let you know how much we appreciate you and your church. Thank you very much. Uh, may the Lord continue to give you strength, health, and continue to bless your church. Uh, Ken Riggs, he preached for us too. He always sends us a nice little letter. You know, Brother Henry Potter that preaches for him. Now, he mailed, some don't do that, but he mails thank you notes. I always sign a little thank you note to the church if I preach a revival for him. But again, in the way of announcement, do remember Wednesday evening, come early for a little fellowship. Uh, remember uh, all the services in front of us. When we get into July, we'll have a quarterly business on the 8th, conference on Saturday night, the, uh, uh, I believe it's on the 11th, communion feet washing on the 12th. And we're planning a, a, another scene. Got some folks, I hope. Brother Brown gave me a card, and it looks real good. I'll try to have a little singing a little later on. We've talked to Brother Philip there. We're going to have a little chip cookout out at their house. Y'all do a good job on that. Got to let it cool, cool down just a little bit, you know. So we'll keep you abreast of that. I believe Nora and Jeremy's planning a little Bible school, maybe about a three-day Bible school 
uh, really two days. You're already here on Wednesday anyway. You know, so sort of keep that in mind. And uh, they want to do something more with the children. I tell you what, I appreciate your willingness, you know. So far as I know, those are about all the announcements. Uh, if you would, uh, we want to receive our morning tithes and also Brother Carlos, if you and uh, Brother uh, Larry would come. Okay, we invite you to give back to the Lord a little portion of that which he's uh, blessed us all with. Brother Carlos, would you bless our morning tithes and offerings? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for another blessed day here on earth. We're so grateful to be here. We're proud of our country, Lord. Thank you so much. We're so glad that we have the church and freedom to worship you, Lord. And offerings today be generous. Your word will go to those who need it, Lord. We ask this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. of our fathers. Happy Father's Day and we've got several fathers and families on vacation. I know Billy and on vacation and several people are gone today but we're glad that you are here today. Turn in your Bibles for a few minutes. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 15. Gospel according to St. Saint Luke chapter 15. I want to read a portion of the parable or the story of the prodigal son. It fits in with Father's Day. But I want to focus mostly on the father this morning. Here we have in the story, we have the son naturally. We have the father, but we have the elderly son also who wasn't really a happy, a happy camper. But I want to sort of focus mostly this morning for a few minutes on the uh, uh, prodigal son's father. You know, the Bible says that we begin reading in verse 11 of Luke chapter 15. The Bible says, and he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divideth unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance or his uh, uh, possessions or livelihood with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him in his fields to feed the swine or the hogs. And he would gladly or fain have filled his belly uh, with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Now, Father, as we take a few minutes this morning and break the bread of life, 
I'm thankful that we're able to pastor such a good church that, that remembers Mother's Day in a very significant way, also remembers Father's Day in a very significant way, for the mothers and fathers are very, very important that are the basic makeup of a home. And we just pray that you'd bless all of our fathers today and bless the children from those homes. And I pray that the kind words that they might share to their fathers might be a great encouragement and a great uplift to each and every one of them. Speak to our hearts together from your word. If there be a need in this place today, we pray that you'd meet your, that need as your riches and glory. In Jesus' name we pray and amen. As we said, I want to share mostly this morning uh, on the Father's part in uh, this particular parable or story. Remember, a parable is an earthly story, but it has a heavenly meaning. Now, uh, notice if you would here in verse 20, the Bible says, of course, the story up to this point, the youngest son has uh, obtained his, what he felt was rightful his inheritance, had gone off to a far country, had wasted any righteous living we know. He finds himself feeding uh, the hogs, which was really being a Jewish family was something they shouldn't do, but he was hungry. And it was the only job he could get, the only thing he could do. So while he's there feeding them, he, 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 his memory begins to play in his mind and he remembers how it was, uh, you know, at his father's house. So he makes a decision <clears throat> to go back to his father, and I've often thought on his way back, I've often wondered, and I've read this story so many, many times, preached it many times, taught it from Sunday school many times, but I've often wondered, we don't know exactly how far it was, but on that journey back, you know, Brother Bill, I've often wondered, how, did he plan a little speech? I gotta figure out what to say, you know, when I get there, what, what am I gonna tell my father? How, how am I, he probably rehearsed that over and over again, uh, what he was going to say, uh, when he got there to where his father was at because he had been gone this long period of time and he comes back, as you will see, uh, needing shoes, robe. Uh, he, he, he had lost everything, uh, you know. So as we pick up the story in verse 20, uh, notice what happens here. Uh, notice his father's compassion. He has compassion. The Bible says in verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. That's the prodigal. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. And notice, he had compassion and ran, fell on his neck, and kissed him. Notice this. You know, do you sometimes wonder if you've read this story, perhaps maybe on many occasions, maybe as the father went out to the field to check on his uh, herd, maybe as he went out to check on his other son, uh, how many times maybe he looked down the road, maybe hoping he would see his son uh, coming home. And the Bible tells us here that uh, the Bible knows he ran to meet him. He didn't, you would think it would be the other way around. The son would have run to meet the father. But the father ran to meet him, to meet that boy. And the Bible tells us here very uh, wonderfully that he had compassion. See, think about that. He had compassion, not anger, not wrath. But he had compassion. Notice, and he kissed him, which was a sign uh, of love by the father for his son. And he was glad to see his son. And something here interesting that I hope you notice here, he never, this father who had compassion, <coughs> uh, kissed him, was glad to see his son. He never questions his son about what he, he, he had done uh, or what, what he had been involved in. He doesn't say, well, I tried to tell you before you left what was going to happen. Give him a big long speech and lecture. He don't do that. He just loved that boy, uh, you know. So he had compassion. But then when we come to verse 21, uh, notice something rather interesting here. The son confesses his failures. He says, and the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. So the son here, you know, again, the father just in, with compassion and love uh, throws his arms around that boy. He's glad to see his son. Doesn't interrogate him and question him as to what he had done, what he'd been involved in. But you know, the boy 
confesses his failures. You know what I said? say? That takes courage. It won't easy for that boy to do that. It took courage. And I, I say again, I wonder from the point A to point B how he might have rehearsed. You know, when I get there, will I receive, you know, will my father receive me? How will the family take me? What should I say? How can I explain? My goodness, what I, how in the world will I ever explain that? Because he come from a good home a good godly home. And I'm imagining all the way there, he had this speech all made up. But before he could do any, do all of this, his father grabbed him and kissed him and hugged him and uh, never questioned him, was glad to see him. And that took courage for that boy, though, uh, to confess his failures. He said, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, verse 21, and no more worthy to be called thy son. You see, he, he left with pride and he left his sin in a far country and he comes back with a humble uh, attitude uh, and spirit. Read verse 21 again. What a great verse. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. Notice this. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But all there are three great verses here. Notice now, as we said, we want to zero in on the Father. Notice the Father's concern. We have his compassion. Uh, uh, you know, now we have the Father's concern. He wanted his son to know something, that he loved him and that he forgave him, uh, for example. Look at verse 20 again. Uh, and he arose, came to his father. When he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. See? Not only that, uh, and ran, fell on his neck, and kissed him. Uh, you know, that's a wonderful thing. I know verse 20. Notice, uh, he gets a hug from his father. The Bible says he fell on his neck. You know what that is? That's in the old Eastern way of doing things. That's just a simple hug. He just grabbed that boy uh, and gave him a great old big, big Baptist, I said a big Baptist hug one time. Notice again in verse 20, not only that, he gave that boy a kiss uh, on the cheek. And notice verse 22, uh, the father gave him the best robe. Verse 22, the father gave him a ring. In each case, the father instructs the servants on what to do, for example. You know, the, son, the ring was a sign that the son still belonged to the family. Now, many speculate that he might have had a ring when he left home, but he lost all his inheritance. He might have pawned that ring or sold that ring or got rid of it. So he didn't have a ring on his finger when he come home. So that was an expression of love in the Orient uh, at that particular time. So uh, in each case, the servant was instructed uh, what to do. But notice in verse 22, the father tells the servants now to put some shoes, put some sandal or sandals on his feet. So we can sort of get the picture. This boy left, you know, with, with good shoes, a good robe, uh, a ring. He left home with, with everything that a, a young man coming out of a fairly wealthy household at that time uh, had. But he comes back. Now he needs a robe. He needs a ring. And he needs shoes on his feet. Uh, he's in bad shape uh, when he comes back, uh, for example. Not only that, uh, in verse 23 and 24, the Bible says, notice if you would, as we read this together, notice, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Well, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they begin uh, to be uh, merry. Uh, you know, here, notice again, a fatted calf is killed and guess what? The part is on to rejoice over his son coming home. Boy, that, that's amazing. Here, here we see a, a, a father's great concern and a father's great compassion uh, for his son. He, he could have been the opposite, you know, and have been angry with his son. And he probably felt like that would have been the right thing to do, maybe. But that shows us a beautiful pictorial representation of God's love for us. Most everyone who gets saved or most everyone who's been saved and get out of fellowship with God, when they come back to him, they find a wonderful 
kind, loving, heavenly Father who will wrap those big arms of love around him and if he'll confess the fact that he has sinned, that he has come short of the glory of God, he's received into the family of God and he cleans us up. We obtain the, the robes of the righteousness of God our Heavenly Father through what Jesus Christ His Son did on the cross at Calvary. So how wonderful it is to stop and think of this earthly father here in this story or parable that Jesus tells who showed such love and such compassion for His Son. He, listen, He didn't interrogate Him and call out all the things He might have done. He just throws His arms around Him, gives Him a big hug, plants a big kiss on His and uh, puts a ring on his feet, on, on his uh, hand and shoes on his feet, a robe on his body, and head of the servants to kill the, the, the fatted calf, and the party was on, rejoicing over the fact that his son has come home. And you know, we're told in the Word of God, when a, an unsaved person comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, there is rejoicing in heaven. Think about that, rejoicing in heaven. You know, it's an amazing thing. I, I remember, probably you remember the same thing, how that when I got saved and, and made peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, how that people rejoiced over my making peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, how they gathered around and Lord, how mercy, must have got 20 or 30 handshakes, I don't know how many hugs along the way I got. And boy, that was a wonderful thing. And it was sort of like saying, sick them to a bulldog. You know, I was ready to go, uh, you know. Stop and think when you got saved, whether it was your parents or a son or a daughter or someone in your family, how they embraced you and was thrilled over the fact that you had made peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a wonderful thing. I remember I went back to the place where I worked. I guess there's 20, 25 people uh, there. And there was just only four or five Christians among the people I worked with. And every one of them was rejoicing. But these others were sort of like the elder son. Uh, it didn't make no difference to them. Just nothing, hardly. But to those that were Christians, you know how many came by and would say, boy, by the time you made the right decision, now you, you get in church and read your Bible and pray and stay in there, stay in there for the Lord, uh, you know. Because uh, they saw the joy of coming to the Lord and making peace with God. And the Father here loved His Son and God loves us. Listen, God loves us. The degree of His love is exemplified in John chapter 3 and verse 16. That's the verse that was preached when I got saved. Well, God so loved the world. Think about that. The world that He gave, that He gave, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, that includes you, that includes me, that includes the whole world, that whosoever believeth puts their trust or confidence in him shall, be saved, shall have eternal or everlasting life. Think about it. Isn't that a wonderful thing when you really stop and think about it? You know, I, I can just see the love of a heavenly father uh, in this story. And I can see the love of an earthly father in this story. And I wonder this morning if we stopped and took time out, how many of us could stop and think of something good that our Father done for us as we was going down the, the, the roadway of life. You've heard me say this, I don't ever remember my Father really coming right out and telling and hugging my neck and telling he loved me. But he proved it every day. There's always a meal on the table. I always had clothes on my back. Maybe not the best that everybody else might have had, but by what everybody else had, we always had a, a roof over our head and I always felt protection at night. When I went to bed, I knew my Father was there. But then when the time come, I'll never forget this, and we enlisted in the military. Uh, they came, picked us up, and took us over to Raleigh, North Carolina. And my daddy, my mother, and uh, two of my sisters, and uh, my one brother was already in Korea, and my other brother was in World War II was there. And, and I, can, I can still see as we got on that old, Brother Carlos, that old C-54. Back then the jets wasn't out. They were prop-driven, propeller-driven. But I can still, I sit down right next to the windows, how it worked out, and the other soldiers, and I looked out, and I saw them standing down there. And I saw my daddy step back, and he took and wiped tears. You know what? I, he had never expressed love for us, but he worked hard every day 
and made a, provided well for our family, but he was not a, a really outward, you would think, loving and emotional father. But I saw him step back behind my wife and my oldest brother, and he wiped tears uh, from his eyes. I'll never forget that, and I know why he done that. It was his way of saying, even though he might have known that I saw him, he was doing that because he loved me and because he was concerned about me and he was interested in me. And I told that story when I preached his funeral after he went, he died. You know, my oldest son and I won him to the Lord when he was in his seven as he lived to be almost a hundred. And we won him to the Lord. And he got in church and made his life count for the Lord. But I'm going to tell you, when he got in church, got right with the Lord, his whole countenance changed. Every time I'd come home, he'd hug my neck and tell me he loved me. You know, that means a great deal uh, to know that. So I say that to youth that are here today. Well, if your father is living, you can. Let them know you love them. It's important. I, I'll tell this and I'll close. I remember one time I, I was preaching a revival in Lebanon, South Carolina. And uh, you may not know where that is, but it was about 100 miles from where my daddy lived. I said, Daddy, I've got to get back to Tennessee, uh, you know, for my services and all, and I'm going to be coming through. Can I want to spend the night with you? He said, yeah, boy, that'd be great. Son said, I said, I won't be in until after midnight. He said, well, that'll be all right. You just come on. He said, I'm going to leave the door open for you. The bed will be, covers will be pulled back. We'll be ready. I said, that's a wonderful thing. You know, thank you very much. So I closed the revival in South Carolina, drove up to Durham, North Carolina, about 120 miles. I got in, it was at least one o'clock, maybe later. It was late. Well, I was so tired, I went in there, got my clothes off, got between them sheets. Come and knock on the door. I looked, he had a clock up there. It's, it's four o'clock in the morning. I ain't been in bed but two or three hours. He said, son, I got the coffee pot on. Boy, I missed you so bad. Said, I wanted to talk to you. Think about that, I wanted to talk to you. I thought, I've got to drive 10 hours from where I live back up here to get back and, and I, on, on a little bit of sleep. Been up all week at that revival. But you know what? We went in there and sat down at the table. And for all the years, he never expressed emotion toward me nor my other family as well. He, he expressed it all at that table. I'll never forget that the longest day. And it really, really helped me as a father to be a better father and a better person and a better pastor. I love God's people. Salvation made the difference in his life. If you're here this morning and you've never made that decision, you meet, need to make that decision. If you're out of fellowship with the Lord, you need to make that decision. The old prodigal beat a hasty path uh, toward home and he found a loving father waiting and with compassion, with love and a big old hug, he found a warm embrace and I'll guarantee you'll find a warm embrace if you come to this altar and make peace with God. Father, as our song leader, pianist comes, we pray a little prayer here this morning. I thank you for this day. This is Father's Day. What a great joy last evening as my children took me out to supper. I thoroughly enjoyed the fellowship of being together. And it's a wonderful thing that we can share with our families and I, I know that here in this church, in years gone by that we've been here, we've, we've placed at rest some mighty fine uh, fathers, wonderful fathers, good providers, love the Lord, love the church, love their families. That's a wonderful thing. And I believe, dear Lord, we still have some great fathers uh, in the service today and in the service from service to service. Some are on vacation today. Some may be traveling. But as we give a little extended time of invitation, if anyone needs prayer, we pray they might come and make peace with God this morning through the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, and amen. What page, brother? 273 in the blue book. Be standing 273, if you would, in the blue book. Join us as we sing together. I love this old song. Ask me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Think about it. Do not pass.
Matthew 5. As we sing the second verse. Let me at a throne of mercy find a sweet Think about it. If you need prayer, you come this morning, not to me, but to the one who can do for you. No one else can do for you. If you need prayer, you come. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. We'll sing the third and fourth verse in closing. If you need prayer, you come. Of all my comfort, more than life to me. If you need prayer, you come. Whom in heaven will be? Oh, if you need prayer, you come this morning. because we said, would God bless you and it's good to see each one of you here uh, on this Father's Day and I hope and pray that you have a, have a good day and uh, I wish my father was living where I could tell him what I'd like to tell him but you know, uh, being a father, my children have done that like I'd like for him to have done. Um, God bless you for being here today. You know the Lord's good. You know that? The Lord's good. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God's blessings upon our lives and we hope to see you early uh, Wednesday evening for a great, great day of course in the Lord. Brother, Jer Brother Jeremy lead us in prayer if you would. Amen. <laughs>